Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Today in our continuing series, The Path Forward, I'm joined by General Stan McChrystal. General McChrystal was uh, our, one of our commanders in Afghanistan. Uh, he's now a, a consultant and has written a new book uh, called Risk, A User's Guide, which we're gonna discuss with him and his co-author, Anna Butrico, uh, General McChrystal and Anna, Welcome to Washington Post Live. Thanks for having us, David. Thank you. So, uh, John Crystal, I, I want to begin by asking you uh, about what's in the news. Uh, we have all, as a country, been focused on Afghanistan uh, since the, the fall of Kabul. You were one of our most prominent commanders uh, there. I want to ask you, um, since the fall of, of Kabul uh, on August 15 and the like it's somewhat chaotic, very chaotic withdrawal of, of uh, Americans and Afghans fr from there uh, in the following two weeks. We've been reckoning with the consequences of the war. I'm wondering if you agree with General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said last week before Congress that he had concluded that this war was a strategic failure. Is that your judgment? Well, David, I don't think there's any way for us to say it was not a failure. It certainly ended differently than we wanted it to. Afghan Afghanistan's in a different place. But at the same time, we'd say that Afghanistan's not the same place it was in 2001. And I am hopeful that the changes in that society, the females that are educated, the young people, will over time be able to be a major force. So I, I certainly wouldn't claim that it's a success, but I don't think there's room to lose all hope either. And, and uh, generally, in the spirit of your book, which is all about assessing risk, judging them uh, sensibly, I'm curious as you look back to the recommendations you made when you were commander in 2009 for a significant increase in American troops, whether you'd revise that uh, uh, recommendation in light of what we now know. Obviously, hindsight is, is an impossible way to, to judge uh, decisions. But were we taking on more risk in the approach that you uh, recommended than we should have? Well, it's a fair question, uh, David. I think that what we were trying to do in 2009 was take a situation which in the moment was problematic. As you remember, that the Taliban was surging there was a lack of confidence on the part of the Afghan people, on the part of our allies, uh, and a weakness in the government of Afghanistan and its security forces. And my assessment was we only had the opportunity to succeed if we could improve the Afghan military, if we could get better performance from the Afghan government, if we could create an environment where confidence on the part of the Afghan people went up. Now, clearly, that didn't happen to the point would we like to. I believe that it was a, I know it was a genuine and good faith effort to produce that. And I think for a period of time there was some, but it's hard for me. I'm probably not the, the most unbiased person you could ask that question to uh, on to whether it was a mistake or not. In my own reflections back over the 15 years that I traveled to Afghanistan and reported on this war as a, as a columnist, I was struck, uh, General Crystal, by the recurring, um, almost continuous bubbles of optimism of our commanders. And they're not surprising. Uh, commanders uh, want to succeed at the assignment that they're given. They want to be creative uh, in how they use uh, military force. But I'm wondering, in this broader context of your book and thinking about risk, uh, how corporations and all of us individuals should think about, about risk. Could you speak for a moment about 
danger that a kind of military group think, a, a collective optimism, a can-do, otherwise admirable can-do spirit, uh, led us into something that in the end we probably couldn't do? Yeah, it's an interesting question. First, I don't believe the premise that Afghanistan was an impossible mission, so I don't buy into that there was no way it could succeed. And I don't think we should use that as an excuse for not succeeding. In fact, I think it didn't succeed in large part because we didn't we didn't do everything that we could and should have as effectively as we could and should have. So we got to look in the mirror and ask those questions. I think your point's exactly right about military leaders. If you have a coach on the day of a big sports event, you ask that coach if his team's going to win, a good coach is going to say yes even if the probability and the pundits all say that it's unlikely. It's, it's part of a dynamic that a coach, one, believes, but almost has to believe to create the confidence inside their organization. That creates a tension, a tension with people standing on the side, and now wait a minute, your team is smaller and slower and, and unlikely to be effective, and yet if you proclaim that you're gonna lose, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there, there's always going to be a tension there that military leaders and the people who listen to military leaders have to understand. I think most military leaders that I saw were giving the best portrayal that they knew at the time. I think there's certainly a dynamic that says, I want I wanted to succeed, therefore I'm gonna accentuate the positive. But you know, that's, that's something that I don't think it's evil, it's, it's probably natural. But it gets to the point that Anna and I reached in our book about risk. Many times the greatest risk to us is in fact us. And it's how well we operate or we don't operate. I want to just stay with this for a moment longer because I think it does have application for all of us in our personal lives. Obviously, the the commanders in Afghanistan, the, the colonels you meet in Jalalabad who were running RC East, as it was called, or the their, their seniors in, in Kabul are going to want the mission to succeed, just as and a division manager working for a, a big manufacturing company is going to want his division to, to succeed. But there is a role for senior management that requires skepticism as they get these recommendations from the field. And I think that's where things sometimes break down. And I want to ask you, you both to comment on that, whether in this case, senior military leadership back in Washington, both civilian and uniformed, uh, needed to be more skeptical about the inevitable uh, proposals for victory that they were getting from, from Afghanistan itself. Anna, you want to start? Sure. So when I think about skepticism, I am drawn to this idea when we, in the book, we argue that risk is the product of threat and vulnerabilities. So it's the external hazards coming your way, as well as your internal weaknesses to respond to them. What General Crystal and I argued is that the internal weakness bit, the, our own vulnerabilities are more important often and are greater um, in our wheelhouse to control than those external hazards. So when I think about skepticism, I think it's hard for us to admit that those internal weaknesses are the point at which we should focus most of our control. Um, it's really easy to point our fingers at the big bad wolf that's knocking at our door rather than the tools that are inside of our house when he tries to blow our house down. So I think the skepticism bit might have been misapplied to that internal weakness part. Sir, would you agree? Would and, and David, you're of course very familiar with uh, the Bay of Pigs failure. And of course, that's where the term groupthink was actually coined after that, the study by Irving Janus. And the reality is you need a process that brings in diverse thoughts, that brings in counter ideas to pressure test anything. In the book, we talk about how President Kennedy received this plan from the CIA. He tried to have his new administration look at it and vet it, but it didn't go very well. And so as a consequence, they went forward with a, an ill-planned invasion that failed dramatically. He learned from the process and in the Cuban Missile Crisis 18 months later, he set up a very different kind of process. 
And I would argue that as we take on important things in our government or our organizations, setting up a process that allows you to bring in diverse perspectives and pressure test your ideas, it gets back to what you're saying. It's how can we trust the, the general or the coach who's not a skeptic? It's fair, but it's also a little unfair to expect that person to be not affected by the fact that they've got to create confidence and whatnot. So you have to create a process that helps balance those things in my, in my experience. That's certainly true about, about the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and it's notable that President Kennedy, from the histories we read, uh, was afraid of appearing weak as a new president and, and went along with a pretty half-baked uh, CIA plan uh, when he should have uh, consulted out, outside experts. I want to ask you both to think about another uh, lesson from the Kennedy presidency, and that's the Cuban Missile Crisis. The interesting thing there is that the so-called executive committee, the, the, this group that Kennedy gathered to help him think through what was truly an existential crisis, we could have had a, a global nuclear war, rather than providing that skepticism, tended to reinforce the most hawkish judgments. And it was only Kennedy's own willingness to step outside of that box personally with his brother that, uh, that, that led to an exit uh, uh, and, a, and a solution. I wanna ask each of you to, to comment on that. The times when sometimes leaders need to separate themselves uh, and make an individual uh, uh, effort to, to, to think out of the box because the box is the group that they've organized to, to, to advise them. Yeah, I'll start if I could. Um, you're, you're exactly right. On day one of the Cuban Missile Crisis, had they taken action, it likely would have been bombing followed by an invasion. And President Kennedy probably would have been on board with that. What he really used the process to do, and I think he used it effectively, was to force the organization to go through a series of steps to widen the spectrum of potential actions, to give him more courses of action, to give him a little time and space. And he stepped aside, and you're right, he used his brother to help drive that process to widen, widen the room a little bit. And suddenly you put things like blockade and quarantine on the table that on day one would not have been there. So I think when we think about organizations, it's creating that dynamic, first understanding the need for that dynamic, then creating that dynamic dynamic that's so important. Anna? Yeah, I would agree. In, in the book, we argue that organizations have what we call a risk immune system. So it's very similar to the human immune system. We argue that leaders are kind of the wrench that keeps all the parts of that risk immune system functioning. So they have to give the time and the space, as General Crystal said, but they oversee how the organization is interacting and responding to risk. So I think, I think intentionally increasing the number of options and being that oversight is what uh, President Kennedy did well. Um, but it's a challenge. We've seen it over and over again, not to get into the biases and the weeds that the rest of the team does. So we, we cover it at length, but yeah, I would agree, definitely. John McChrystal, you were the leader of, uh, of JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, which was responsible for our uh, intense effort to go after uh, those who threatened uh, the homeland, threatened our troops uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. This was hard-nosed warfare uh, at its uh, uh, most ad ad advanced form. I want to ask you the, the question that, that I hear people asking me, I'm sure the uh, organizations that you consult uh, are asking you, and that is, how worried should we be as a country, should we be as individuals, about a resurgence of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan now that we're gone, now that the Taliban is running the show in Kabul, that could threaten our homeland in the way that we were threatened 20 years ago? Yeah, I think it is a very real possibility. I don't think there's any guarantee that it will come from inside Afghanistan because it really could come from almost any place in the world, particularly if you talk about cyber being a major weapons system now. But I think Afghanistan could offer a couple of things. It could offer a demonstrable victory uh, to motivate a bunch of people who would say we should continue on the fight. And so I think you've got 
that inspirational part of it. And then you've got the, the very practical part that if the Taliban regime provides safe haven, then it could it could create that dynamic. But I don't think it vastly increases the risk. I think the risk is already there. I want to ask you about uh, part of the book that uh, interested me, um, and that is the, your personal discussion about your own family. You note uh, at one point that your father was a soldier, his father was a soldier, your four brothers are soldiers, your wife's father was a soldier, that, that you're surrounded by a, a, a family, a tribe almost, uh, of, of, of people uh, for whom the military is the, the intimate bond, thing that they that live by. I, I want to ask about the benefits of that and also the dangers of having uh, this relatively small group in our society that's, that serves uh, it with such intensity passed down from generation to generation. And then maybe ask Anna if she jump in and talk about ways in which she, as your co-author, would try to deal with this uh, extraordinary uh, military tradition that's part of your life. Yeah, I think that's a great angle. Uh, and I'm, I really want Anna to, to weigh in honestly on this, Anna, so don't, don't be intimidated to, to take me on here. But you're right. I grew up as, in a military family, and even more so, when I would travel around Afghanistan as a senior commander and stop at out-of-the-way bases, invariably one of the senior NCOs or lieutenants at that base was the son or daughter of a comrade of mine. So what you describe is not specific to the McChrystal family, it's specific to a whole bunch. And that creates an insularity that's not really good for a democratic nation. I mean, we've got a very professional military and I'm proud of them, uh, but the reality is, I think it needs to be participated in by the entire spectrum of our society. Because if everybody thinks and looks like Stan McChrystal, you're not gonna get much diversity of thought or a range of different ideas. Anna? It's an interesting question. I, so I have no military background personally at all. Um, I have, my grandparents have served in the military, but I personally do not have any at all. So when we started this project on risk, obviously General McChrystal walked in with a, of course, military appreciation for the subject. Uh, that, that really dominated a lot of his thinking historically. But as he's transitioned out of the military, works now with McChrystal Group, a consulting firm, he realized that a lot of the lessons and observations of risk in the military transcended the battlefield and were happening in organizations and in government and you name it. So I sit more on, on the other side, not so much the military, on the organization side not in the government so as much, but I really, we came in together to put those approaches, ideas, perspectives to create something that's not just a military appraisal of risk, but how all organizations struggle with the idea that the greatest risk to us is us. So bringing in some ideas about even the high jump as an example of um, dealing with risk, looking at Formula One racing, looking at the Hurricane Katrina response, we definitely have military examples, but they are, are accompanied and strengthened as well with examples that are not military based. So I think that's why if this was a productive partnership personally, to bring those ideas and, together. And that's why we made it a partnership. Uh, Anna's not a ghostwriter or a subordinate author. It was co-authors because I thought an old white soldier and a young lady with a very different education background, very different generational, uh, look, we're going to we're going to create a better balance than than what we get. And that's exactly what we got. And Anna can give as good as she gets. So if you get in a room and start negotiating on a chapter with her, you'll find that it was a pretty even uh, negotiation. Well, that, that's a good co-author's statement. I should just note, uh, General Crystal, you and I have talked in the past uh, in public forums about the importance of some kind of program of national service that brings us together uh, from all of our different uh, racial, gender, other backgrounds uh, to, to serve and work together and, and, and hopefully become uh, a more united uh, society and country. Maybe you just briefly want to speak about your own f focus on national service. 
and, and where you think that proposal stands. Yes, sir. We, we just saw the sad collapse of Afghanistan, partly because they were not connected to their society enough and the society was not interconnected enough. I fear that's what's happened in the United States. And many people view citizenship as something you get by accident of birth and you don't really have to do anything for. You're expected to vote and to pay taxes, but many people don't vote at the rate they should. And so there's less sense of responsibility to society, society being other Americans. And that's largely because we don't know other Americans. We watch different TV, we live in different zip codes, we don't interact and we've gotten pretty tribal. And so my sense of national service is an idea to give young Americans an experience that will help make them better citizens. It's not to get low cost labor to go build trails in parks, although that can be part of the work. It's to give every young American a year of full time national service so they're dedicated to something bigger. So they serve with people from a different background so that they get the satisfaction that they have contributed something to society. And then if we do those things in society, like give education benefits and whatnot, they feel like they've earned them because we value what we've earned. So I think it's a, it could be a great unifying force that makes us a better group of citizens. I want to ask you about another idea in your book. As you mentioned earlier, you have this uh, metaphor uh, for the, the uh, risk immune system. And one thing we know about immune systems is that as essential as they are to fighting off disease, keeping the body healthy, that sometimes immune systems can overreact. And I, I use that as a way to ask you whether sometimes we overstate risks in a way that makes us weaker than we need to be because we're so fearful about things that are relatively low percentage, low probability. Is that something that, that, that you see? And how do you advise organizations to deal with that question of overestimating risk? Andy, you want to jump on that? Sure. So we say the risk immune system has four imperatives and, and four real goals. So one is that you, it detects the threat. It assesses the threat based on your personal vulnerabilities it responds to the risk, and then it learns from the process. What I think leaders and organizations tend to do is if you're thinking about threat, we tend to be, while I, I acknowledge your question is about overreacting, our book really acknowledges the underreacting. So if we look at COVID-19, for example, the Department of Health and Human Services ran an exercise called Crimson Contagion that predicted something like COVID-19. Before Hurricane Katrina, a Hurricane Pam exercise predicted COVID-19. So while people do overreact and are quite sensitive to the threats that are approaching, as well as their vulnerabilities to respond to them, General McChrystal, my findings is that the opposite is more apparent and arguably more dangerous. Uh, time and time again, we're seeing people mitigate threats or say it's not as bad as, as you think, you know, we're stronger, we're strong enough to react. Um, but that's proved to be the most dangerous um, tendency. Sir, would you would you agree? I, I do. It's underreacting to the tobacco threat years ago or to climate change. But but I do think, David, you got a really good point. And I think a lot of people who have a stake in it, they're incentivized to create the idea of a crisis because they they benefit politically or they benefit financially or in some way. And that's where our, the maturity of our, of our uh, system really needs to kick in because we know that with information technology now, you can trumpet a cause, you can create something, feel like a much bigger crisis than it might actually be and you can get people pretty energized about it. And we've seen leaders do that and whatnot which is dangerous in the extreme. And so the, mat the maturity of our system, and this comes back to communication, it comes back to uh, eliminating or trying to reduce or at least understand biases, and then the idea of leadership. And that is to, to sort of pull people back and say, wait a minute, let's put that particular issue in context. Take immigration problems, for example, we had a period when suddenly we, it looked like we had people storming the walls of the Alamo. And that wasn't the reality. Certainly it's a problem, 
but but things like that put in proper perspective, then we can deal with them much more, much less emotionally and more effectively. I suspect that many of the parents uh, watching uh, Washington Post Live today uh, have the experience of trying so hard to minimize risks for their children that they sometimes overprotect their children and deny them the very lessons that are most valuable uh, in life. I'll just leave that as a as a moderator's uh, aside. I want to ask you about something in business that has always interested me, and that's the importance of managers giving uh, their key uh, uh, subordinates what I like to call the freedom to fail. And General Crystal, you were uh, experienced, uh, highly respected uh, commander through your, your career. You wanted to develop your young officers and, and, and soldiers, um, but the freedom to fail if you're in the military can get you or the guy next to you killed. So how, do you, how did you strike that balance? Allow people to develop um, uh, to, by taking risks, but, but no one to, the, to keep the risks within bounds. Yeah, it's a, it's a real problem because what we found in peacetime was <clears throat> any training accidents or people who got heat injuries or whatnot, things which will happen if you are training realistically and hard enough to truly prepare for war would come at great cost to a commander's career. So as a consequence, <clears throat> many commanders would find excuses not to push their forces hard in peacetime training as they really needed to because it carried some career risk to them. And that's an insidious thing because the organization says, well, we don't wanna hurt our soldiers in training and who's against that? But the reality is we wanna be ready for combat. So, so I, I grew up in many ways seeing that. When we got in combat, what I found was in many cases there were pressures to reduce the risk to our force. So for example, in Afghanistan, we had a rule that every soldier had to wear every piece of body armor issued to them. And that could be pretty heavy. And if you're trying to climb mountains in Afghanistan, that, that's just a non-starter, you can't do it. And so for leaders to do what they had to do at altitude, they had to violate orders that were given about every soldier had to wear all their body armor all the time. And you create this dynamic that says, I want to drive risk to zero in an inherently risky business. And so you have to build in your organization a couple of things. One is leaders have got to learn to make mature balances, judgments on how much risk to accept this way to reduce other risks that come. And two, more senior leaders particularly have got to understand that when Ted Williams had his highest season in 1941, he batted a little over 400. He still failed 60% of the time. So I found out in the counterterrorism world that if we were going to be effective against the enemy, we needed to do a lot of operations. If we did a lot of operations, we were going to fail a lot. And when we failed a lot, we had to one, accept that, and two, we had to learn from it. So you, if you try to drive the risk of failure to zero, you won't do much. And if you don't do much, you often can't accomplish your mission. So it really takes leaders willing to, one, understand that, and then two, to accept that. So, Anna, how, how do we get uh, young uh, managers, young uh, people in whatever uh, field of life to be the Ted Williams, to, to be uh, happy if you're hitting four out of 10 uh, John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco, once told me he wasn't looking for the 10 out of 10 hitter. That person wasn't taking enough risks. How do, how do we get people to, to be comfortable um, in our zero defect culture with failing sometimes? We argue in the book that the greatest risk to us is us. So if we take that idea and we accept it, say, okay, we present our own greatest risk, but there's also, we, we also provide ourselves with the greatest opportunity. So let's take advantage of, of the ability to fail. Let's take advantage of the opportunity to mitigate our vulnerabilities. Let's take a moment to assess the threat and know that through iteration, through trial and error, I mean, just as a human immune system, when it's uh, confronted by a threat, it gets stronger. Our risk immune systems, when they're confronted with threat, get better. We're better at detecting them. We're better at assessing them based on our vulnerabilities. We're better at responding. We're better at learning. 
So if you fail, you'll get better. This is if you get sick, hopefully you won't get sick again. So trial and error. So I, I want to thank you both for a fascinating uh, tour of the world of risk. The book is called Risk, a User's Guide for all, for all users in that sense. Uh, General Crystal, uh, Anna Butrico, thank you for joining us on Washington Post Live today. Thank you, David. Thank you. So we hope uh, that she'll be back with us soon. Uh, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com to look at the programs we've got coming. Please register for those that look like they might be of interest to you. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you later this week uh, in our programming. Thanks for joining us today.